today we're here to talk a little bit about affordable housing, but also within the context of how we create healthier and more dignified cities like Nairobi. Just a little bit about the work that we do. Orchid Studio is a social enterprise based here in Nairobi, which is providing a turnkey or an end-to-end -end design and construction service, which is really focused on creating that healthier, more dignified built environment. We have a big vision. We're looking to create not only a design build service, but to train women in construction. We work always with at least 50% women in our design studio and on our construction sites. We're also involved more and more in creating more holistic and sustainable communities, and we're working on a scalable prefabricated housing solution. So you're all aware that uh, uh, Africa is urbanizing very quickly. We don't only have a shortage of affordable housing, but we lack the capacity to deliver uh, what is required. Just to paint the picture, uh, we require about 27 million housing units by 2050. The population of Africa will be about 2.2 billion then. The National Construction Authority has identified that we only have 130,000 skilled construction workers. We also have a shortage of qualified professionals, that means architects and engineers, and currently about 58% of buildings in Nairobi are inhabitable. Specifically on housing, as we've been discussing uh, since yesterday, the biggest problem is in affordability. But additionally, we are uh, lacking design innovation. We have little focus in environmental management and preservation, and we are relying heavily on dated construction materials and methods. We have a climate crisis, not just here in Africa, but globally. The language on that has changed even in the last six months. No longer is it climate change, but it's climate emergency, climate crisis. Africa contributes only a small amount, relatively, to that amount of global uh, emissions each year. However, it's one of the most vulnerable parts of the world for the effects of climate change. And as the population grows, like Panina mentioned, the contribution that we make is going to be substantial. And so the way that we build our cities and the way that we contribute to that in the built environment is huge. And construction is no small part. It contributes 40% of global carbon emissions. When I look around Nairobi, I look at most of the materials that are being used, and very few of them have good environmental uh, credentials. It's largely quarry stone and concrete, which doesn't create an environment that we ultimately will want to live in. There's also little guidance for us to follow. The Kenya Climate Change Act is silent on the link between climate change and the built environment. So it's very difficult to know or to be, to be led in how we actually make that change. And so maybe the responsibility is more on those in the room today. Just to reiterate what the PS said yesterday, um, I think the mitigation measures towards this impending crisis is largely in materials use. So as my colleague has just said, our industry is heavily reliant on concrete and stone which do not provide a good uh, impact to the environment, mostly because they are depleting our natural resources and they have a high embodied energy. There's opportunity in emerging materials which leverage local resources and local labor, some of which we are using in our uh, projects. But the uptake is very slow and the manufacturing capacity as well is limited. Collaboratively, we believe that the building sector can drive the demand. The other angle that we want to talk about is not just creating an environment which is good for our planet, but also one that is good for us as human beings and citizens of our cities. Many Kenyans live in images or in buildings like the one in this image. They lack natural light, effective ventilation, and they have almost no access to nature or green space. And yet, as humans globally, we spend more than 90% of our lives in buildings or on transport. Now in Nairobi, that's probably more weighted towards transport, I realize. However, in our buildings, we still spend a substantial amount of time. And so the impact that those have on our physical and psychological health and well-being is immeasurable. Yet the model that we seem to be pursuing is one that we know from elsewhere in the world is failed. It prioritizes private transport and poor design leads and discourages human interaction. 
And yet there is research out there, there's proof to say that more walkable cities, more inclusive neighborhoods and communities have incredible benefits, not only to our health, but also to reducing rates of crime, to fostering greater creativity in society and to improving civic engagement. And for the developers and financiers here today, it's also proven that these attributes can raise the value of, of land and of sales in a way that is driven by aspiration and livability. Nairobi's a city that I've made my long-term home. It's a city that I love. However, in the last 10 years or so that I've been here, I've seen it change in ways which I'm not that excited about. It ranks currently very low on the livability index globally. And if we continue with some of the patterns that we're seeing, are we going to live in a city in 10 or 20 years time that we all want to be a part of? Like many Nairobians, I've grappled with the question of whether Nairobi really is home. Partly because most of us associate our home with where we come from, that is in the rural village. And that is part of the problem because we don't invest in our cities. I remember growing up, we relied heavily on public transport. Uh, if you're Kenyan, you'll remember the double-decker Kenya bus service, um, which is not there anymore. Uh, we still have a heavy reliance on private uh, transport. And you, if you're visiting, you've probably grappled with traffic congestion. Other problems that we suffer from are air pollution, uh, water shortages, uh, waste management problems, and our natural resources are depleting. So the question we're grappling with is, who wants to live in a city that's not livable? Who wants to call it home? We're gonna share a couple of quick case studies. Um, some of these are things that are not immediately viable in the next year or two, but maybe in the next five. Some of them are things that we just need to be brave and take a chance on. The first looks at our forest cover. We've lost almost three quarters of the historic uh, forest cover in Kenya. And although there are efforts to increase this back up to at least 50% or 10% of, of tree cover, um, there's a huge amount that we can gain by re restoring sustainably managed forests, not only for the benefit of our climate and air quality, but also for our economy and our construction industry. We know that natural climate solutions can contribute almost 40% of carbon mitigation over the next 10 years under the Paris Agreement, of which almost three quarters lies alone in sustainably managed forestry. And so timber is suddenly a material that is incredibly sustainable and incredibly viable. Yet I know some of the impressions that timber has in Kenya. Many think it's weak, it's not very durable, it's susceptible to termites, all things that are largely true. However, engineered and modern products like cross-laminated or glue-laminated timber, which are so soaring in popularity in other parts of the world and are now at competitive price points, are also competitive against concrete and steel from the perspective of strength and durability, whilst also having a much more sustainably positive impact. One of the applications of this material is in prefabricated uh, homes. We are currently in the research and development phase of this new technology, working with collaborative partners like the Dune Foundation. And some of the benefits we see in this new technology is in uh, increased efficiency, time control, quality control, new job creation, and social benefits overall, including environmental sustainability. The other case study is a project that we're very excited to be involved in with a first time developer here in Kenya called Home. They're very progressive in the way that they're thinking about environment and climate. And so whilst we're using very low carbon materials, we're also challenging the way that we want to live within this community. We're breaking down barriers between neighbors. We're looking at innovative co-living and co-work models to question how we interact with the people that live alongside us. And we're also prioritizing the pedestrian space over the transport space. In doing this, we're also targeting 50% less cement than normal or similar developments. It's low carbon, mainly through use of local materials and offset measures. But critically, we believe that we can deliver this for a cheaper price than your traditional stone and concrete construction. There's a strong link between affordability and high density. And in fact, the affordable housing program does allow developers to negotiate higher density bonuses 
to, uh, as an incentive towards affordability. But we feel strongly that there are some associated challenges with this, including strained infrastructure, we risk reducing the open spaces, and we also compromise on the design. However, if we have smaller but smarter design, which incorporates flexibility and user comfort within the space, uh, you can have uh, innovative furniture design, Outside of the house, you can have walkable neighborhoods, more inclusive design that caters for the disabled and the elderly, and also co-living spaces, as Mr. Ravi had mentioned in one of his developments. To finish, we want to put out a call to action. I've been really excited and encouraged by a lot of the presentations over the last day or two. I think many people care about some of the things that we're talking about and are thinking about this in their own work. However, a lot of what we talk about when we're at conferences like this or roundtables is the numbers. We want to make a profit. We want to reach the number of units that is required for the population growth in countries like Kenya. But if we do that in a way where we're not still also prioritizing the environmental and social impacts, then we will not live in a city that we really want to be a part of. And I think that it's an exciting opportunity today as we go out to lunch next and as we socialize uh, throughout the rest of the conference to talk about these things and come together, whether we're architects or designers, developers, financiers, or policymakers, to think how will Nairobi look, not just today, not just tomorrow, not even in 10 years time, but 100 or 200 years from now, is this the city of the future? Thank you. Thank you.